The Golden Honeymoon by Ring Lardner. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Mother says that when I start talking, I never know when to stop. But I tell her the only time I get a chance is when she ain't around, so I have to make the most of it. I guess the fact is neither one of us would be welcome in a Quaker meeting. But as I tell Mother, what did God give us tongues for if he didn't want we should use them? Only she says he didn't give them to us to say the same thing over and over again, like I do, and repeat myself. But I say, well, Mother, I say, when people is like you and I been married fifty years, do you expect everything I say will be something you ain't heard me say before? But it may be new to others, as they ain't nobody else lived with me as long as you have. So she says, You can bet they ain't, as they couldn't nobody else stand you that long. Well, I tell her, you look pretty healthy. Maybe I do, she will say. But I looked even healthier before I married you. You can't get ahead of mother. Yes, sir, we was married just fifty years ago, the seventeenth day of last December, and my daughter and son-in-law was over from Trenton to help us celebrate the golden wedding. My son-in-law is John H. Kramer, the real estate man. He made $12,000 one year and is pretty well thought of around Trenton. A good, steady, hard worker. The Rotarians was after him a long time to join, but he kept telling him his home was his club. But Edie finally made him join. That's my daughter. Anyway, they come over to help us celebrate the golden wedding, and it was pretty crimpy weather, and the furnace don't seem to heat up no more like it used to, and Mother made the remark that she hoped this winter wouldn't be as cold as the last, referring to the winter previous. So Edie said if she was us and nothing to keep us home, she certainly wouldn't spend no more winters up here, and why didn't we just shut off the water and close up the house and go down to Tampa, Florida? You know, we was there just four winters ago and stayed five weeks, but it cost us over $350 for hotel bill alone. So Mother said we wasn't going no place to be robbed. So my son-in-law spoke up and said that Tampa wasn't the only place in the South, and besides, we didn't have to stop at no high-price hotel, but could rent us a couple of rooms and board out somewheres. And he had heard that St. Petersburg, Florida was the spot, and if we said the word, he would write down there and make inquiries. Well, to make a long story short, we decided to do it, and Edie said it would be our golden honeymoon, and for a present my son-in-law paid the difference between a section and a compartment so as we could have a compartment and have more privacy. In a compartment you have an upper and lower berth just like the regular sleeper, but it is a shut-in room by itself and got a wash bowl. The car we went in was all compartments and no regular berths at all. It was all compartments. We went to Trenton the night before and stayed at my daughter and son-in-law, and we left Trenton the next afternoon at 3.23 p.m. This was the 12th day of January. Mother sat facing the front of the train, as it makes her giddy to ride backwards. I sat facing her, which does not affect me. We reached North Philadelphia at 4.03 p.m., and we reached West Philadelphia at 4.14, but did not go into Broad Street. We reached Baltimore at 6.30, and Washington, D.C. at 7.25. Our train laid over in Washington two hours till another train come along to pick us up, and I got out and strolled up the platform and into the Union Station. When I come back, our car had been switched on to another track, but I remembered the name of it, the La Bell, as I had once visited my aunt out in Okanomawak, Wisconsin, where there was a lake of that name, so I had no difficulty in getting located. But Mother had nearly fretted herself sick for fear I would be left. Well, I said, I would have followed you on the next train. You could have, said Mother, and she pointed out that she had the money. Well, I said... We are in Washington, and I could have borrowed from the United States Treasury. I would have pretended I was an Englishman. Mother caught the point and laughed heartily. Our train pulled out of Washington at 9.40 p.m., and Mother and I turned in early, I taking the upper. 
During the night we passed through the green fields of old Virginia, though it was too dark to tell if they was green or what color. When we got up in the morning it was at Fayetteville, North Carolina. We had breakfast in the dining car, and after breakfast I got in conversation with the man in the next compartment to ours. He was from Lebanon, New Hampshire, and a man about eighty years of age. His wife was with him, and two unmarried daughters, and I made the remark that I should think the four of them would be crowded in one compartment, but he said they had made the special trip every winter for fifteen years and knowed how to keep out of each other's way. He said they was bound for Tarpon Springs. We reached Charleston, South Carolina at 12.50 p.m. and arrived at Savannah, Georgia at 4.20. We reached Jacksonville, Florida at 8.45 p.m. and had an hour and a quarter to lay over there, but Mother made a fuss about me getting off the train, so we had the darky make up our berths and retired before we left Jacksonville. I didn't sleep good as the train done a lot of hemming and hawing, and Mother never sleeps good on a train, as she says she is always worrying that I will fall out. She says she would rather have the upper herself, as then she would not have to worry about me. But I tell her I can't take the risk of having it get out that I allowed my wife to sleep in an upper berth. It would make talk. We was up in the morning in time to see our friends from New Hampshire get off at Tarpon Springs, which we reached at 6.53 a.m. Some of our fellow passengers got off at Clearwater and some at Bel Air, where the train backs right up to the door of the Mammoth Hotel. Bel Air is the winter headquarters for the golf dudes, and everybody that got off there had their bag of sticks, as many as ten and twelve in a bag, women and all. When I was a young man, we called it shinny and only needed one club to play with, and about one game of it would have been a plenty for some of these dudes, the way we played it. The train pulled into St. Petersburg at 8.20, and when we got off the train, you would think they was a riot, what with all the darkies barking for the different hotels. I said to Mother, I said, it is a good thing we have got a place picked out to go to, and don't have to choose a hotel, as it would be hard to choose amongst them if every one of them is the best. She laughed. We found a jitney, and I give him the address of the room my son-in-law had got for us, and soon we was there, and introduced ourselves to the lady that owns the house, a young widow about forty-eight years of age. She showed us our room, which was light and airy, with a comfortable bed, and bureau, and washstand. It was twelve dollars a week, but the location was good, only three blocks from Williams Park. St. Pete is what folks calls the town, though they also call it the Sunshine City as they claim they's no other place in the country where they's fewer days when old Saul don't smile down on Mother Earth, and one of the newspapers gives away all their copies free every day when the sun don't shine. They claim to have only given them away some sixty-odd times in the last eleven years. Another nickname they have got for the town is the Poor Man's Palm Beach, but I guess they's men that comes there that could borrow as much from the bank as some of the Willie boys over to the other Palm Beach. During our stay, we paid a visit to the Lewis Tent City, which is the headquarters for the Tin Can Tourists. But maybe you ain't heard about them. Well, they are an organization that takes their vacation trips by auto and carries everything with them. That is, they bring along their tents to sleep in and cook in, and they don't patronize no hotels or cafeterias, but they have got to be bona fide auto campers or they can't belong to the organization. They tell me there's over 200,000 members to it, and they call themselves the tin canners on account of most of their food being put up in tin cans. One couple we seen in the tent city was a couple from Brady, Texas, named Mr. and Mrs. Pence, which the old man is over 80 years of age, and they had come in their auto all the way from home, a distance of 1,641 miles. They took five weeks for the trip, Mr. Pence driving the entire distance. The tin canners hails from every state in the Union, and in the summer they visit places like New England and the Great Lakes region, but in the winter the most of them comes to Florida and scatters all over the state. While we was down there, there was a national convention of them at Gainesville, Florida, and they elected a Fredonia, New York man as their president. 
His title is Royal Tin Can Opener of the World. They've got a song wrote up, which everybody has got to learn it before they are a member. The tin can forever, hurrah boys, hurrah! Up with the tin can, down with the foe, we will rally round the campfire, we'll rally once again, singing we auto camp forever. That is something like it. And the members has also got to have a tin can fastened onto the front of their machine. I asked Mother how she would like to travel around that way, and she said, Fine, but not with an old rattle brain like you driving. Well, I said, I am eight years younger than this Mr. Pence who drove here from Texas. Yes, she said, but he is old enough to not be skittish. You can't get ahead of Mother. Well, one of the first things we'd done in St. Petersburg was to go to the Chamber of Commerce and register our names and where we was from, as there's great rivalry amongst the different states in regards to the number of their citizens visiting in town, and of course our little state don't stand much of a show, but still every little bit helps, as the fella says. All in all, the man told us there was 11,000 names registered, Ohio leading with some 1,500-odd, and New York State next with 1,200. Then come Michigan, Pennsylvania, and so on down, with one man each from Cuba and Nevada. The first night we was there, there was a meeting of the New York, New Jersey Society at the Congregational Church, and the man from Ogdensburg, New York State, made the talk. His subject was rainbow chasing. He is a Rotarian and a very convicting speaker, though I forget his name. Our first business, of course, was to find a place to eat, and after trying several places, we run on to a cafeteria on Central Avenue that suited us up and down. We eat pretty near all our meals there, and it averaged about $2 per day for the two of us, but the food was well cooked and everything nice and clean. A man don't mind paying the price if things is clean and well cooked. On the third day of February, which is Mother's birthday, we spread ourselves and eat supper at the Poinsettia Hotel, and they charge us 75 cents for a sirloin steak that wasn't hardly big enough for one. I said to Mother, Well, I said, I guess it's a good thing every day ain't your birthday, or we would be in the poorhouse. No, says Mother, because if every day was my birthday, I would be old enough by this time to have been in my grave long ago. You can't get ahead of Mother. In the hotel they had a card room where there was several men and ladies playing 500 and this newfangled whist bridge. We also seen a place where they was dancing, so I asked Mother would she like to trip the light fantastic toe, and she said no. She was too old to squirm like you have got to do nowadays. We watched some of the young folks at it a while till Mother got disgusted and said we would have to see a good movie to take the taste out of our mouth. Mother is a great movie heroine, and we go twice a week here at home. But I want to tell you about the park. The second day we was there, we visited the park, which is a good deal like the one in Tampa, only bigger, and there's more fun goes on here every day than you could shake a stick at. In the middle, there's a big bandstand and chairs for the folks to sit and listen to the concerts, which they give you music for all tastes, from Dixie up to classical pieces like Hearts and Flowers. Then all around, these places marked off for different sports and games. Chess and checkers and dominoes for folks that enjoys those kinds of games, and roke and horseshoes for the nimbler ones. I used to pitch a pretty fair shoe myself, but ain't done much of it in the last 20 years. Well, anyway, we bought a membership ticket in the club, which costs $1 for the season, and they tell me that up to a couple of years ago it was 50 cents, but they had to raise it to keep out the riffraff. Well, Mother and I put in a great day watching the pitchers, and she wanted I should get in the game. But I told her I was all out of practice and would make a fool of myself, though I seen several men pitching who I guess I could take their measure without no practice. However, there was some good pitchers, too, and one boy from Akron, Ohio, who could certainly throw a pretty shoe. They told me it looked like he would win them championship of the United States in the February tournament. We come away a few days before they held that, and I never did hear if he win. 
I forget his name, but he was a clean-cut young fella, and he has got a brother in Cleveland that's a Rotarian. Well, we just stood around and watched the different games for two or three days, and finally I sit down in a checker game with a man named Weaver from Danville, Illinois. He was a pretty fair checker player, but he wasn't no match for me, and I hope that don't sound like bragging. But I could always hold my own on a checkerboard, and the folks around here will tell you the same thing. I played with this weaver pretty near all morning for two or three mornings, and he beat me one game, and the only other time it looked like he had a chance, the noon whistle blowed and we had to quit and go to dinner. While I was playing checkers, Mother would sit and listen to the band, as she loves music, classical or no matter what kind. But anyway, she was sitting there one day, and between selections, the woman next to her opened up a conversation. She was a woman about Mother's own age, 70 or 71, and finally she asked Mother's name, and Mother told her her name, and where she was from, and Mother asked her the same question. And who do you think the woman was? Well, sir, it was the wife of Frank M. Hartzell, the man who was engaged to Mother till I stepped in and cut him out 52 years ago. Yes, sir. You can imagine Mother's surprise. And Mrs. Hartzell was surprised, too, when Mother told her she had once been friends with her husband, though Mother didn't say how close friends they had been, or that Mother and I was the cause of Hartzell going out west. But that's what we was. Hartzell left his town a month after the engagement was broke off, and ain't never been back since. He had went out to Michigan and become a veterinary, and that is where he had settled down, in Hillsdale, Michigan, and finally married his wife. Well, Mother screwed up her courage to ask if Frank was still living, and Mrs. Hartzell took her over to where they was pitching horseshoes, and there was old Frank waiting his turn. And he knowed Mother as soon as he see her, though it was over fifty years. He said he knowed her by her eyes. Why, it's Lucy Frost, he says, and he throwed down his shoes and quit the game. Then they come over and hunted me up, and I will confess I wouldn't have knowed him. Him and I is the same age to the month, but he seems to show it more some way. He is balder for one thing, and his beard is all white, where mine has still got a streak of brown in it. The very first thing I said to him, I said, Well, Frank, that beard of yours makes me feel like I was back north. It looks like a regular blizzard. Well, he said, I guess yourn would be just as white if you had it dry cleaned. But Mother wouldn't stand that. Is that so? she said to Frank. Well, Chancey ain't had no tobacco in his mouth for over ten years. And I ain't. Well, I excused myself from the checker game, and it was pretty close to noon. So we decided to all have dinner together, and there was nothing for it, only we must try their cafeteria on Third Avenue. It was a little more expensive than ours, and not near as good, I thought. I and Mother had about the same dinner we had been having every day, and our bill was a dollar ten. Frank's check was a dollar twenty for he and his wife. The same meal wouldn't have cost them more than a dollar at our place. After dinner we made them come up to our house, and we all sat in the parlor, which the young woman had give us the use of to entertain company. We begun talking over old times, and Mother said she was as scared Mrs. Hartzell would find it tiresome listening to we three, three talk over old times. But as it turned out, they wasn't much chance for nobody else to talk with Mrs. Hartzell and the company. I have heard lots of women that could go it, but Hartzell's wife takes the cake of all the women I ever seen. She told us the family history of everybody in the state of Michigan, and bragged for a half hour about her son who she said is in the drug business in Grand Rapids and a Rotarian. When I and Hartzell could get a word in edgewise, we joked one another back and forth, and I chafed him about being a horse doctor. Well, Frank, I said, you look pretty prosperous, so I suppose there's been plenty of glanders around Hillsdale. Well, he said, I've managed to make more than a fair living, but I've worked pretty hard. Yes, I said, and I suppose you get called out all hours of the night to attend births and so on. Mother made me shut up. Well, I thought they wouldn't never go home, and I and Mother was in misery trying to keep awake, 
as the both of us generally always takes a nap after dinner. Finally they went, after we had made an engagement to meet them in the park the next morning, and Mrs. Hartzell also invited us to come to their place the next night and play 500. But she had forgot that there was a meeting of the Michigan Society that evening, so it was not till two evenings later that we had our first card game. Hartzell and his wife lived in a house on 3rd Avenue North and had a private setting room besides their bedroom. Mrs. Hartzell couldn't quit talking about their private setting room like it was something wonderful. We played cards with them, with Mother and Hartzell partners against his wife and I. Mrs. Hartzell is a miserable card player, and we certainly got the worst of it. After the game, she brought out a dish of oranges, and we had to pretend it was just what we wanted, though oranges down there is like a young man's whiskers. You enjoyed them at first, but they get to be a pesky nuisance. We played cards again the next night at our place with the same partners, and I and Mrs. Hartzell was beat again. Mother and Hartzell was full of compliments for each other on what a good team they made, but the both of them knowed well enough where the secret of their success laid. I guess all in all we must have played ten different evenings, and there was only one night when Mrs. Hartzell and I come out ahead, and that one night wasn't no fault of her. When we had been down there about two weeks, we spent one evening as their guest in the Congregational Church at a social give by the Michigan Society. A talk was made by a man named Bidding of Detroit, Michigan, on how I was cured of storytelling. He is a big man in the Rotarians and give a witty talk. A woman named Mrs. Oxford rendered some selections, which Mrs. Hartzell said was grand opera music, but whatever they was, my daughter Edie could have give her cards and spades and not made such a hullabaloo about it neither. Then they was a ventriloquist from Grand Rapids and a young woman about 45 years of age that mimicked different kinds of birds. I whispered to mother that they all sounded like a chicken, but she nudged me to shut up. After the show, we stopped in a drug store and I set up the refreshments and it was pretty close to 10 o'clock before we finally turned in. Mother and I would have preferred tending the movies, but Mother said we mustn't offend Mrs. Hartzell, though I asked her had we come to Florida to enjoy ourselves or to just not offend an old chatterbox from Michigan. I felt sorry for Hartzell one morning. The women folks both had an engagement down to the chiropodists, and I run across Hartzell in the park, and he foolishly offered to play me checkers. It was him that suggested it, not me and I guess he repented himself before we had played one game. But he was too stubborn to give up, and sat there while I beat him game after game, and the worst part of it was that the crowd of folks had gotten the habit of watching me play, and there they all was, hooking on, and finally they seen what a fool Frank was making of himself, and they began to chafe him and pass remarks. Like one of them said, Whoever told you you was a checker player? And... You might be good for tiddlywinks, but not checkers. I almost felt like letting him beat me a couple of times, but the crowd would have known it was a put-up job. Well, the women folks joined us in the park, and I wasn't going to mention our little game, but Hartzell told about it himself and admitted he wasn't no match for me. Well, said Mrs. Hartzell, checkers ain't much of a game anyway, is it? She said, it's more of a children's game, ain't it? At least I know my boy's children used to play it a good deal. Yes, ma'am, I said. It's a children's game the way your husband plays it, too. Mother wanted to smooth things over, so she said, Maybe there's other games where Frank can beat you. Yes, said Mrs. Hartzell, and I bet he could beat you pitching horseshoes. Well, I said, I would give him a chance to try, only I ain't pitched a shoe in over sixteen years. Well, said Hartzell, I ain't played checkers in twenty years. You ain't never played it, I said. Anyway, says Frank, Lucy and I is your master at five hundred. Well, I could have told him why that was, but had decency enough to hold my tongue. It had got so now that he wanted to play cards every night, and when I or mother wanted to go to a movie, 
Any one of us would have to pretend we had a headache and then trust to goodness that they wouldn't see us sneak into the theater. I don't mind playing cards when my partner keeps their mind on the game, but you take a woman like Hartzell's wife, and how can they play cards when they've got to stop every couple of seconds and brag about their son in Grand Rapids? Well, the New York, New Jersey Society announced that they was going to give a social evening too, and I said to Mother, I said, well, that is one evening when we will have an excuse not to play 500. Yes, she said. But we will have to ask Frank and his wife to go to the social with us, as they asked us to go to the Michigan social. Well, I said, I had rather stay home than drag that chatterbox everywhere as we go. So Mother said, You are getting too cranky. Maybe she does talk a little too much, but she is good-hearted. And Frank is always good company. So I said, I suppose if he is such good company, you wished you had have married him. Mother laughed and said I sounded like I was jealous. Jealous of a cow, doctor. Anyway, we had to drag them along to the social, and I will say that we give them a much better entertainment than they had given us. Judge Lane of Patterson made a fine talk on business conditions, and the Mrs. Newell of Westfield imitated birds, only you could really tell what they was the way she'd done it. Two young women from Red Bank sung a choral selection, and we clapped them back, and they gave us home to our mountains, and Mother and Mrs. Hartzell both had tears in their eyes, and Hartzell too. Well, some way or another, the chairman got wind that I was there, and asked me to make a talk, and I wasn't even going to get up, but Mother made me, so I got up and said, Ladies and gentlemen, I said, I didn't expect to be called on for a speech on an occasion like this, or no other occasion, as I do not set myself up as a speechmaker, so will have to do the best I can, which I often say is the best anybody can do. Then I told them the story about Pat and the motorcycle, using the brogue, and it seemed to tickle them, and I told them one or two other stories, but together I wasn't on my feet more than twenty or twenty-five minutes, and you ought to have heard the clapping and hollering when I sat down. Even Mrs. Hartzell admitted that I am quite a speechifier, and said if I ever went to Grand Rapids, Michigan, her son would make me talk to the Rotarians. When it was over, Hartzell wanted we should go to their house and play cards, but his wife reminded him that it was after 9.30 p.m., rather a late hour to start a card game. But he had went crazy on the subject of cards, probably because he didn't have to play partners with his wife. Anyway, we got rid of them and went home to bed. It was the next morning, when we met over to the park, that Mrs. Hartzell made the remark that she wasn't getting no exercise, so I suggested that why didn't she take part in the rope game. She said she had not played a game of rope in twenty years, but if Mother would play, she would play. Well, at first Mother wouldn't hear of it, but finally consented more to please Mrs. Hartzell than anything else. Well, they had a game with a Mrs. Ryan from Eagle, Nebraska, and a young Mrs. Morris from Rutland, Vermont, who Mother had met down to the chiropodists. Well, Mother couldn't hit a flea, and they all laughed at her, and I couldn't help from laughing at her myself, and finally she quit and said her back was too lame to stoop over. So they got another lady and kept on playing, and soon Mrs. Hartzell was the one everybody was laughing at, as she had a long shot to hit the black ball, and as she made the effort, her teeth fell out on the cord. I never seen a woman so flustered in my life, and I never heard so much laughing, only Mrs. Hartzell didn't join in, and she was madder than a hornet, and wouldn't play no more, so the game broke up. Mrs. Hartzell went home without speaking to nobody, but Hartzell stayed around, and finally he said to me, he said, Well, I played you checkers the other day. And you beat me bad. And now what do you say if you and me play a game of horseshoes? I told him I hadn't pitched a shoe in sixteen years, but Mother said, Go ahead and play. You used to be good at it, and maybe it will come back to you. Well, to make a long story short, I give in. I oughtn't to have never tried it, as I hadn't pitched a shoe in sixteen years, and I only done it to humor Hartzell. 
Before we started, Mother patted me on the back and told me to do my best. So we started in, and I seen right off that I was in for it, as I hadn't pitched a shoe in sixteen years and didn't have my distance. And besides, the plating had warred off the shoes so that they was points right where they stuck into my thumb. And I hadn't thrown more than two or three times when my thumb was raw, and it pretty near killed me to hang on to the shoe, let alone pitch it. Well, Hartzell throws the awkwardest shoe I ever seen pitched, and to see him pitch you wouldn't think he would ever come nowhere near. But he is also the luckiest pitcher I ever seen, and he made some pitches where the shoe lit five and six feet short and then schoonered up and was a ringer. There's no use trying to beat that kind of luck. They was a pretty fair-sized crowd watching us, and four or five other ladies besides Mother, and it seems like when Hartzell pitches, he has got to chew, and it kept the ladies on the anxious seat, as he don't seem to care which way he is facing when he leaves go. You would think a man as old as him would have learnt more manners. Well, to make a long story short, I was just beginning to get my distance when I had to give up on account of my thumb which I showed it to Hartzell, and he could see I couldn't go on, as it was raw and bleeding. Even if I could have stood it to go on myself, Mother wouldn't have allowed it after she seen my thumb. So anyway, I quit, and Hartzell said the score was 19 to 6, but I don't know what it was, or don't care, neither. Well, Mother and I went home, and I said I hoped we was through with the Hartzells, as I was sick and tired of them but it seemed like she had promised we would go over to their house that evening for another game of their everlasting cards. Well, my thumb was giving me considerable pain, and I felt kind of out of sorts, and I guess maybe I forgot myself. But anyway, when we was about through playing, Hartzell made the remark that he wouldn't never lose a game of cards if he could always have mother for a partner. So I said... Well, you had a chance fifty years ago to always have her for a partner, but you wasn't man enough to keep her. I was sorry the minute I had said it, and Hartzell didn't know what to say, and for once his wife couldn't say nothing. Mother tried to smooth things over by making the remark that I must have had something stronger than tea or I wouldn't talk so silly. But Mrs. Hartzell had froze up like an iceberg and hardly said good night to us and I bet her and Frank put in a pleasant hour after we was gone. As we was leaving, Mother said to him, Never mind Charlie's nonsense, Frank. He is just mad because you beat him all hollow pitching horseshoes and playing cards. She said that to make up for my slip, but at the same time she certainly riled me. I tried to keep a hold of myself, but as soon as we was out of the house, she had to open up the subject and began to scold me for the break I had made. Well, I wasn't in no mood to be scolded, so I said, I guess he is such a wonderful pitcher and card player that you wished you had married him. Well, she said, at least he ain't a baby to give up pitching because his thumb has got a few scratches. And how about you, I said, making a fool of yourself on the rope court, and then pretending that your back is lame and you can't play no more. Yes, she said, but when you hurt your thumb, I didn't laugh at you, and why did you laugh at me when I sprained my back? Who could help from laughing, I said. Well, she said, Frank Hartzell didn't laugh. Well, I said, why didn't you marry him? Well, said Mother, I almost wished I had. And I wish so, too, I said. I'll remember that, said Mother. And that's the last word she said to me for two days. We seen the Hartzells the next day in the park, and I was willing to apologize, but they just nodded to us. And a couple days later we heard they had left for Orlando, where they have got relatives. I wish they had went there in the first place. Mother and I made it up, sitting on a bench. Listen, Charlie... She said, this is our golden honeymoon, and we don't want the whole thing spoilt with a silly old quarrel. Well, I said, did you mean that about wishing you had married Hartzell? Of course not, she said. That is, if you didn't mean that you wished I had, too. So I said, 
I was just tired and all wrought up. I thank God you chose me instead of him, as there's no other woman in the world who I could have lived with all these years. How about Mrs. Hartzell? says Mother. Good gracious, I said. Imagine being married to a woman that plays 500 like she does and drops her teeth on the rope court. Well, said Mother, it wouldn't be no worse than being married to a man that expectorates towards ladies and is such a fool in a checker game. So I put my arm around her shoulder and she stroked my hand and I guess we got kind of spoony. There was two days left of our stay in St. Petersburg and the next to the last day, Mother introduced me to a Mrs. Kendall from Kingston, Rhode Island, who she had met at the chiropodists. Mrs. Kendall made us acquainted with her husband, who was in the grocery business. They've got two sons and five grandchildren and one great-grandchild. One of their sons lives in Providence and is way up in the Elks, as well as a Rotarian. We found them very congenial people, and we played cards with them the last two nights we was there. They was both experts, and I only wished we had met them sooner instead of running into the Hartzels. But the Kendalls will be there again next winter, and we will see more of them. That is, if we decide to make the trip again. We left the Sunshine City on the 11th day of February at 11 a.m. This give us a day trip through Florida, and we seen all the country we had passed through at night on the way down. We reached Jacksonville at 7 p.m. and pulled out of there at 8.10 p.m. We reached Fayetteville, North Carolina at 9 o'clock the following morning and reached Washington, D.C. at 6.30 p.m., laying over there half an hour. We reached Trenton at 11.01 p.m. and had wired ahead to my daughter and son-in-law, and they had met us at the train, and we went to their house, and they put us up for the night. John would have made us stay up all night telling about our trip, but Edie said we must be tired and made us go to bed. That's my daughter. The next day, we took our train for home and arrived safe and sound, having been gone just one month and a day. Here comes Mother, so I guess I better shut up. End of the Golden Honeymoon Read by Rick Rodstrom